So thank you everybody for bearing with me and my scheduling uh, issues last time. Apologies for that. Um, I'm going to talk about Java and real-time processing. Um, so if you read my article that kind of started this, this whole uh, thing here today, um, it was about storing data in an off-heap Java store, not using a native plugin, let's say, or using JNI, but using something built into Java, but not to put data into the heap. And the reason being that you sometimes have applications that have to store very, very large amounts of information, storing it in the heap can expose you to some GC issues. Now, things have changed over the years with Java and GC, and it's improved so much that it's not as much of an issue as it used to be, but it can still be an issue. So th that's why I, I, I built this system. Um, I have a background with real-time systems. Uh, I built real-time trading systems, real-time news and quote systems, real-time order routing systems. I did it in C and C++, and then I got involved with real-time Java when I was at Sun Microsystems. Um, there's a specification called the real-time specification for Java, and there are some implementations of that. Um, I wanna say that it never really gained the momentum that, that maybe people like myself thought it would. It's a little bit niche. Uh, there aren't as many providers of that as there used to be. We'll go into that in a little bit, um, but uh, that it's still a thing. So we're gonna, I, wanted to, I wanted to assume that maybe you read the article we're going to talk about what's in the article, but I wanted to talk about real time and Java leading up to that to give more of like that educational point of view. And then we can talk about things after. And I'm sure there'll be things that I say that are uh, you can call me out on um, and say, well, you know, GC is great in Java. We don't need any of this. Maybe so. Um, and I'll, I'll give you plenty of ammunition for that as well. But uh, that always makes it fun. So what do I mean by real time? A lot of people think that real time means real fast. And that's not always the case. I mean, performance is a goal in everything you do, but real time is really about being predictable. And it's also a real time application is anything that has a time-based requirement or temporal constraint that adds to the correctness of the condition. So it's not just what you do getting an answer, it's when you provide that answer. And if you provide that answer later than what you need to provide it, it's a wrong answer. Even if it's mathematically correct, it's still a wrong answer because it's too late. And um, there are many different use cases for this, and we'll talk about some of them, but there are also different types of real time. Uh, and maybe you've heard some of these. There's hard real time, soft real time, and non real time. Um, and it's really a measurement of how critical your, your deadline is or your timing is to the correctness. So you might hear something, someone say, well, I have a hard real time requirement. And that means that something has to be processed within a certain amount of time within an event or based upon a certain like you know periodic uh, timer uh, it has to be has to be done at that particular time any time later or sometimes even before uh, is considered a bad thing and you know if you think of flight control systems on airplanes and an ele even an elevator is a hard real-time system um, where things have to happen or you'll, you'll miss your floor, right? The elevator just skip right past the floor if it misses this, if it doesn't uh, react to that sensor in time to know that it's approaching that floor. Um, soft real time, it means that you, you have some flexibility in there. You know, you can be a little bit after your deadline, but you know, within a certain, certain constraint, uh, you know, plus or minus. Uh, and non real time means that there's just, there's no real time requirement. And, and most of what we do with our general purpose operating systems on our computers are non-real-time systems. Things sometimes are latent. Um, I've mentioned the word deadline. Uh, it means that that's the time something has to be completed by. So you re receive a trade request. Uh, you must process that trade within five milliseconds. That is the stated uh, service level agreement. That's the deadline that someone says. And the reason why you may have that type of a deadline in a trading system is because markets move very rapidly. If I have a, an order in that says if the, if the stock price goes down and hits this level trade and the system doesn't react in time, it might trade lower or a lot lower than that, that particular price that I wanted to execute at. And that represents you know, lost money uh, or for somebody at least, even, even if things uh, even if that latency, if I can put a trade request in and there's some latency there and it takes 500 milliseconds and the market moves in my favor, someone else, it was out of their favor. Uh, and, it, and, that's, and that's an issue. Uh, a lot of the companies I work with um, being in New York here, uh, working with different banks, um, milliseconds translated into hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, in potential risk. Uh, and they would do anything to, to reduce that. Um, 
the word latency to define when I say that, what I mean, it's the difference between when an event happens and your application observes it, right? So if you say that an actuator must be invoked within 500 microseconds of an event, um, anything beyond that is considered unacceptable latency. Um, and every system has latency uh, and uh, you have to be able to control that. And it's really also about being predictable. And I think the next slide start talking about that. Um, so real-time systems focus on latency, knowing and ensuring the worst case response time to an event. And that's what it comes down to, worst case, and, and not looking at the average. And that's very important. Average will give you, will, will cover up your worst case, your, your out of bounds, uh, you know, late, latent responses. It's also about scheduling tasks in a specific order. So if, if uh, your system supports or should support um, priorities, so you can set your thread priorities a certain way, you should know that your, your, prior, your, schedule, your threads are gonna be scheduled according to their priorities uh, strictly. And it's also about timing, You'd be using high resolution timers to know that if I set a periodic task to run every uh, 500 microseconds that it's going to start every, on every 500 microsecond boundary. And to have that type of um, you know, uh, timer, you have to have a high resolution timer in your system. And not every system does. I, I think like a Raspberry Pi, or at least some of the older ones do not have a real time high resolution timer capability. And that's, uh, that could be an issue for a real time system. Um, and also predictability. I mentioned this, but we'll go into that. You want to know without a doubt that when that something is going to happen always when it's supposed to happen, that something will not get in the way. And that something can be other applications, it can be other system services, it can be interrupts, it can be paging in your operating system because things are being paged in and out because you have memory pressure, and it can be things like garbage collection in, in uh, Java. Um, could be, and there are other sources of unpredictability in Java as well, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll talk about that right now. Unpredictable um, events in Java include class loading and initialization. So your code is running and you're in a time critical section of your code and you, you, know, you instantiate something in that code and it has to load the class if it was for the first time. So it has to do class loading and initialization. That can be unexpected, unpredictable amount of latency there that you, that you didn't account for. Um, JIT uh, compilation and including re-optimization. So you, know, you start to think about when your application starts, your code gets JIT compiled. There's a lot of jitter in the system. And then that's kind of almost a reuse of the word, but it's not. Um, there's a lot of unpredictability in the system early on, but things can also be, once they're JIT compiled um, down to native code within, you know, from, from your bytecode, they can be re-optimized later. And you never know when that's going to happen. A real-time Java implementation assures you that that won't happen, that things will be JIT compiled once and, and maybe you have some control over it later. Um, just some internal virtual Java virtual machine algorithms, things that happen inside the virtual machine um, beyond just these uh, can happen at any time and, and you know, give you unpredictable latency. And then, of course, garbage collection. And garbage collection, like I said, and I'll keep saying it, has improved over the years. And this latency uh, has, has um, and interruption has, you know, lessened. And, uh, but it can, still, it can still happen. It can still affect your applications. Now, it, besides just Java, Unpredictable events can happen with any application, C and C++ applications. Um, you may have shared resources across multiple threads that leads to all sorts of contention that starts to interrupt the uh, execution of priority-based execution or the strict priority-based execution and leads to something called priority inversion, which we'll talk about. Um, just be IO within the system. You're, you make a call to the, to the disk, um, to the network. Um, it's unpredictable how long any of that's going to take. Uh, unless you have a, a, a you know a real time system end to end, and even things like memory management in C, I once saw somebody say that the the largest GC like event they ever occurred was calling free in a in a C application a C plus plus application, um, because it there's you know the C runtime actually does do some type of of garbage collection of its own. It's not like automatic memory management in Java. But there is, there are, you know, walking, it walks internal maps of, of free spaces and, and, and compacts memory and so forth. So that can lead to unpredictable timing in, in C and C++ applications. Let's talk about GC interference. And th these are, these are, you know, we're going back in time when we talk about stop world GC. And it's not, this doesn't happen really anymore. But um, just to give you context, where it all began was 
the most efficient garbage collector out there is going to be one that stops all the mutating threads, all your application threads that change the heap, we call them mutating threads, and does what it needs to do across the heap to collect garbage. And, um, you know, sometimes that's a bit of a misnomer. It actually walks live objects and uh, moves them uh, to compact the free space. Um, that obviously stops your application if the market moved uh, to where you're supposed to execute a trade and then can continue to move and then the GC ends and then you realize, oh my God, I missed this event because of GC. Well, that, that stop world GC is the biggest offender of that. Parallel GC and concurrent GC, what do those mean? What are the differences? Parallel GC simply means that the garbage collection occurs across multiple garbage collection threads, it can still stop your application. It's just that it does the garbage collection work by the creating threads and doing it in parallel to itself. Concurrent GC is where it can do a lot of the garbage collection work concurrently with your application threads. So that's the difference. Parallel is, does the GC work in parallel to itself? Concurrent GC means it does the GC work in parallel or concurrent to your application. Um, the concurrent GC within Java, which has been superseded by things like G1 and some others, um, it, it would basically do most of its work concurrently with your application, but there were certain points, certain checkpoints where it had to stop application threads. And even the Sun had a real-time Java product that had a really advanced uh, parallel concurrent GC. It even had um, you know stop checkpoints and, and had to had to do things where it had to align application threads and uh, while they were you know, what they call write barriers and, and so forth um, to do some, some of its work, even though it was very small amount of latency in the microseconds, it still was technically latency. I mentioned priority inversion. Um, I'm not sure how many people understand what this is. So I'm just going over everything here uh, just to be thorough. Um, this is out of, actually I wrote a book on real-time Java. I don't recommend buying it because it's a bit out of date now, but I just, if you've read my book, you've probably seen this diagram. Uh, I have, let's say we have three application threads and the highest priority thread is at the top, T1. T2 is a mid priority. T3 is a low priority, lower priority thread. Um, and you know, what happens is I'll say a thread gets released. It means it's actually, it's eligible to execute. So thread T3, the lowest priority of these three threads gets released first. It runs for a little bit. And let's say it acquires a lock on resource R1. Then a little while later, um, the highest priority thread in your system gets released, meaning it's eligible to execute. It was sleeping before, but now it's gonna run. So it's gonna preempt thread T3 as it should because it's a higher priority. Now it runs along and at some point, thread T2 gets released, eligible to execute, but it does not because it's a lower priority than your highest priority thread T1. Uh, so th thread T1 continues to run. It doesn't get preempted, that's the point. Um, but at some point later, thread T1 blocks on resource R1. So it tries to take a lock out on it for whatever reason. However, it cannot because thread T3, a lower priority thread, has a, a hold on that lock, but it's, pre it's, uh, it's asleep because it's been preempted by task T1. And this obviously uh, assumes a, a single core, single CPU system. Um, so what happens is this leaves thread T2 eligible to execute and actually gets scheduled and starts executing. So in a way, thread T2, lower priority than thread T1, has preempted thread T1, which should never happen. But it happens because of this resource contention. Priority inheritance says, okay, in a real-time system, not every system does this, you have to have a real-time system, and you have to have a real-time VM that also works with that system. Um, will say, you know what, as soon as thread T1 goes to get a, a, re, a lock on that resource R1, what it will do is it will elevate thread T3's priority to that of thread T1. Thread T3 will get executed rele until it releases its lock and then thread T1 will execute. So that, that eliminates that contention. There is still a little bit of latency there and a little bit of jitter. There's some interference, but it's much smaller than it would have been otherwise in this system. Let's talk about Java real-time requirements. I mentioned this a little bit. Thread priorities, you need strict adherence to thread priorities. You need enough granularity to be able to, to schedule your, your threads accordingly. Um, this, this may be changing, and I haven't looked at it in, in recently in the latest uh, VM updates. There's so many of them these days. 
Um, but uh, you know, Java standard edition really, I think has like three thread priorities in it that, it that it really adheres to. And that may not be enough. You may need to schedule things a little bit more fine grain than that. A real time VM uh, will give you more granularity. And it also needs to give you, um, you know, also have, to, also have to have it work with and on an OS that gives you real time scheduling options. I wanted to give you an example of some work I did. This is a chart of, um, you know, an application that was uh, a simulated trading system. Uh, when I was working with, with banks in New York, I used to use this to discuss what a real-time VM was and, and its differences with standard Java SE. Um, and you can see here, what happens is what's graphed is a response to an event. And most of the time that response is like around or under hundred microseconds, which is what I wanted. Um, but you see that there are these outliers that go up to, you know, three and a half seconds, uh, if, if you will, or, or 3.5 milliseconds, I'm looking at the, the scale there. Either way, pretty big outliers in this, um, which represents a non-real-time system, right? I want real-time behavior, but I have quite a few big events here that are, or that are outliers. If I were to average this, it would still meet my 100 microsecond deadline, right? It would appear to at least because it averages out to just about 100 microseconds, but there are these outliers and that's what's really important in a real-time system. Um, not, not many people are, you know, see that, understand that until they see that graph. Here is the same code running on a real-time Java VM on a real-time OS. At the time it was Solaris, but you can get a real-time Linux uh, now. And I think most, most even on my, my laptop here has probably got a real-time kernel in it. Um, I apologize for the scale being different. You can see that here, right? Everything here, on this real-time VM occurs in under 140 microseconds. Um, some, you know, I wanted everything to be 100, under 100 microseconds. There are a few outliers that were up to about you know, just over 120, 130, but much better than these, you know, 3.5 millisecond outliers and one millisecond outliers and so forth that you saw there. Um, that's the difference between a real-time VM and, and, a, and the standard VM. You get this; um, these outliers are not existent compared to what you saw in Java SE all the time you get this behavior, not just the average. Another example, um, and it's hard to see that, that uh, on the uh, left-hand side, I put this in here just because it has the same scale, right? This is a standard Java SE application running where I think, um, if I remember properly, those large outliers you see are garbage collection events that were occurring. Um, on real time, on the real time VM, you see that these are always under a millisecond, which is what I was looking for in this behavior. Here, it's uh, usually a, a, quite a few outliers above, and um, even some others that were that were getting close. Um, so that's the difference. And I think you know you, you've probably seen other demonstrations as well, maybe a Java one and so forth, where where you saw graphs like these. Um, so here are some of the points throughput is generally lost to real-time behavior. I mentioned throughput before, the averaging of your, real, of your, of your responses um, it covers up the outliers. You run on a real-time VM on a real-time OS, it helps you get rid of those outliers, but there is a cost. The time goes somewhere. Just like you have uh, you know, energy cannot be created or destroyed. For the most part, when you're executing your code, time cannot be created or destroyed. That time goes somewhere. If you have a system that will guarantee you won't have those outliers, you'll probably lose a little bit of throughput. Um, and for some people that's not always acceptable, but it's what happens in a real-time system. But if latency is important, um, you know, you, you'll be willing to give up some of that throughput. And for the most part, um, people can provide more hardware to, to target the throughput issue, but you cannot just throw hardware at a real-time issue. You can still have this unpredictable behavior that throws you out off and, and gives you these outliers. Um, that was the point of that. Some of the real-time VMs that uh, I alluded to earlier that are out there right now, there's Azul. Uh, we were talking about Guillotine a little bit earlier uh, and his company Azul. There's J the Jamaica VM uh, by ICUS. Um, and I know that company very well. I work with them. I work with the Jamaica VM very closely on, uh, and I also work with VXWorks from Wind River, which is a real-time real -time OS and have quite a bit of, of success with that on some autonomous vehicle work I did in the past. Uh, there are other companies like Perk. Um, there's IBM. <clears throat> they cost money, though. Uh, Sun had one as well. It's, Oracle did not continue development on it. Uh, they pretty much mothballed it. Um, but all these VMs, they cost money, whereas you can download Java SE for free. Um, and they also provide, um, or they expose slightly different development paradigms. Um, 
something like Jamaica VM requires you to, or they don't require, but they, but you're, it's, in, it's in your best interest to pre ahead of time JIT compile your code. So you take your Java, you, you, you know, you compile it just like you would into bytecode, and then you run an extra compilation step that pre JITs, <laughs> which I you know, shouldn't use just in time compilation then, pre compiles your code to native. Um, so that you don't have any jit jitter and then you don't have you know any of these issues and then you can use a real-time VM, a real-time OS and get absolute real-time, hard real-time behavior. Like I said, they cost money. They have slightly different development paradigms. They're good things if your application requires it. You have a helicopter that's running, uh, you know, real-time, has a real-time need that's running on Mars, for instance, you may require this and, or your flight control system will lose control of your helicopter and it will crash on the surface of Mars and you won't be able to do anything about it. Uh, but in other cases, um, if you have a, an application with soft real-time requirements, you have a financial application, like I mentioned before, you really just want to improve your probabilities. So this is one of those things where you can argue with me back and say, I don't need a real-time VM. I can do things. I can make my application be more, more predictable. I agree. There are some things that you can do. It's never going to be 100% predictable. It's not going to be as good as using something like Jamaica VM pre-compiled on VxWorks, but you, you can improve your probabilities. For example, um, you can identify the time critical parts of your application. It's probably not everything. It's probably only about 10% of your overall application that when you do something, it's time critical there. Or when something happens, now it's time critical. So you make sure in that part of your code that you're very careful about what you do. Um, and you can increase your probability for predictability. You can go from, let's say, six out of 10 times that trades complete there outside of your five millisecond window down to nine out of 10 trades complete within five milliseconds. Well, that's probably a really good improvement. Um, same thing if you have a, uh, you know, let's say this is a 5G system and, and you're, you're handling calls and, or just some kind of telecommunications and you want to make sure that uh, you, you don't drop calls or your SLA is that only one out of a million call is ever dropped. But with standard Java SE, you, you sometimes drop one out of 100,000 because of garbage collection events, other things that happen in the system and so forth. If you can improve that and get close to one out of a million, you've met your SLA and you can do that. How do you do that? You have to avoid JIT and GC. Now, Java is, I think, slowly moving to an ahead of time compile compilation where, you know, let's say it gets JIT compiled, you can, you can save the context of that. I don't think they're there yet. There was an experimental feature added to one of the, the JVM releases. I'm not sure if it's still available or where it's headed. And also, um, the, the, the modern Java VMs, if you've moved off of, let's say, Java 6, 7, or 8, and you're moving now to 14, 15, 16, some of the GCs, these GCs are excellent. They're fantastic. Um, that will help as well. But still, like I said before, large heaps, let's say you have, you know, for your uh, hedge fund application, <laughs> you need 16 gigabytes of data. Um, to be available at all times, to be uh, indexed, to handle all the mathematics that are involved in your, in your trading system. Um, that's a large heap. Uh, this laptop I'm running on has, a 32, has 32 gigabytes of memory. I can create large heaps, and at some point, it can become a bit of an issue, right? If, if garbage collection occurs across that large of a heap, even with these excellent GC uh, implementations, there can still be some interference that, that affects me. So large heaps are usually avoided. Um, so the answer is don't put it in the heap, right? And that's easier said than done. There are some alternatives like the RTSJ specifies uh, alternative memory areas in the, in the heap. And that's, uh, it, again, that's the different development paradigm that you have to follow. You can put data in a file, but then there, you might have latency looking it up in the file. You can put it in an external database that may be better because there's caching and there's all sorts of, of modern uh, implementations there, but there still may be some latency in, involved in that. You can put it in native memory, and that's fantastic, right? Because now the garbage collector won't, won't be looking through there. But now you have to use JNI or JNA. Um, but still, there's a different development paradigm you have to use there. But there's something built in to Java called the mapped byte buffer, or, or just byte buffer, but in this case, map byte buffer, um, that allows you, that has an option, when you create a, you know, a region of memory here, to actually use native memory. And then you can, then you, you can use it with Java without having to go through JNI and JNA. And that's what we're gonna talk about. And I apologize for those mark, those pen markups uh, there. I thought they were gone. Uh, I was testing something so I can point stuff out in code, but I thought I, really, I got rid of those, sorry. Um, so map byte buffer, what is it? It's based on byte buffer, uh, which is itself 
a Java NIO class built on Buffer, extends Buffer, I think it's an interface. Um, it allows you to store primitive data types in memory. And that could be the heap, right? And it also supports random access, um, but you can call allocate direct and it uses native memory. And when you use that native memory, that stuff is not subject to garbage collection within that region. The whole map byte buffer would be, if you didn't have any references, let's say you created a huge map byte buffer, that's fantastic, use it all you want. The garbage collector doesn't care, except for the actual pointer to the map byte buffer. Uh, if you'd have no more references to that map, map byte buffer, then it will just be garbage collected, but it's one object, so that's not a big deal. Uh, the point is within that region, it's all yours. Um, it can also be mapped to a file. That's the map byte buffer part of it. You can just use byte buffer and have it be all in memory, or you can use map byte buffer and map it to a file. And now you have durability, right? So you, have, you can create a write through cache, for instance. So the data is in memory, but it's written through the cache, through to disk. Um, it does have a couple of drawbacks. You have to handle all of this random access yourself, and it has a maximum size per byte buffer of two gigabytes, maximum integer, signed integer size. That's what that is. Um, so that means if you want to store more than two gigabytes of data in a byte buffer, you've got to create multiples of them. Um, and um, you know, that's fine. That's a strategy you can do. Um, I'm actually, well, I'll get into that later, but um, I'll give you some examples. This is, I wanted to be able to mark this up and, and point things out to you, but I'll just use the mouse pointer. There are different ways you can create a mapped byte buffer that gets stored to disk, right? You can create a random access file, set its length, create the file channel from it, and then create a map byte buffer, providing it that file channel, and uh, or actually calling fi file that file channel dot map, giving it some, some information. And uh, then you've got your map byte buffer and you can store data in there all you want and, uh, and, and do what you like within that region. It's just a, a region of bytes that now gets stored to disk also. Um, you can create just a plain old file and create a file, from that file, get the file input stream, from there, you know, get the channel, file channel. And then once again, on that channel, you can call map and you've got your map byte buffer as a result. Or you can create a file channel directly and, uh, you know, you have options, but they pretty much are all the same. You just have to, uh, you know, either create a file or a file channel. And then from there, you, you create your map byte buffer. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how you use it. <clears throat> to save data, to a mapped byte buffer. I started with this first because if you're gonna read data, it's gotta be in there. Um, you have, let's say you have a person object and on that person object, you have fields that like, you know, first name, last name, social security ID, I don't know, you know, all different things, uh, salary, age, uh, whatever, whatever it is you're doing in your application. You can just very simply uh, create a byte buffer to tell it to allocate direct, that is going to allocate native memory. And then you call one of these methods put int, put float, put, or just bytes. Uh, you have lots of options, all the, all the primitive types. You can, you, can, you can take an object, serialize it to a byte stream and write it out to that as well. Um, that's fantastic. And then you read it in just by, you know, you create your person object, it's new, it's empty. Um, and you just read it in, in the same order you wrote it out to. So now you start to see some of the challenges. So if I start writing to this byte buffer, I have to know, you know what I wrote and what order I wrote it in. And then where do things stop and end, right? If I write one object, where does the next one start? So you start to have the need for a database-like system. And that's where this off-heap database comes in. So all of that lead up, the real-time requirements, uh, why you would want to do this was just the motivation behind why, you know, why this was born. And I, I was telling Yuri uh, early on, and not everybody was on yet, I started by, I built my own messaging system. So it was a JMS, Java Messaging System Compliance System. Uh, it was very simple, it had no, it required no configuration. Uh, different instances running in the network would discover one another, <clears throat> as long as they were, you know, able to see each other, one another, or on, on the, routable on the network. Um, they would self-configure, self-cluster, um, and provide higher availability. So if one instance went down, another instance would handle the destinations and deliver messages for the other one. And uh, they would also share the load and it was fantastic. Um, what I did is I gave, you know, there's an option. There was an option to say, if you create a queue, let's say you can have it be a persistent queue or a non-persistent queue. So I would create a byte buffer or, or a map byte buffer for that queue to back it uh, accordingly. Um, and 
either way, it was the same interface, uh, which was good, but in the map byte buffer case, it would actually write out to disk and it would read from disk when it started up. So if there are queued messages that were never delivered and you shut your system down and then you started it up the next day or a system failed, it would read it back from disk and, and instantly populate the queues with the undelivered messages. Um, I did this and it worked very well. I used map byte buffer, I used native implementation, uh, you know, the allocate direct, so use used native and it, and it did fantastic for garbage collection, but I, I had to create an index, right? Because now you have to know where objects or messages, the objects that represent the messages begin and end in this byte buffer. And I, you know, initially had that index just be in, in heap and I would walk this file uh, when the system started and create the index on the fly. Um, and sometimes if you had enough messages and enough objects that represent those messages in that off heap, you know, store, it wasn't quite a database at that point, um, that would take up quite a bit of heap. And that would be an issue if you had, let's say millions of messages flying. Think of an email server on a, on a you know, large company. Um, there are, you know, each inbox represents a queue. Uh, there are you know, large amounts of messages that can be indexed. Uh, so the index itself became unwieldy. So I said, let me create, a, let me go all out with this. Let me create a database that is an in-memory database with this optional write through to disk using this, this concept. So I did that. Um, now, map byte buffer gives you that random access. So you have to know where, you, you have to program this yourself and that's what I did. You have to know where your records start and end. And that's fine because you can position right to specific points in your byte buffer or map byte buffer, I'll just call it byte buffer, uh, very easily just by calling that position message, that method and giving it the actual byte location you wanna go to. So here, I, you know, this is something from my article you would have to know that um, you know, the first 12 bytes was an active record and the, the next 14 bytes was another active record. And then you have a 10 byte record, it's just data that's being stored. Um, and then you have a 22 byte gap there that's an inactive record and then an eight byte record. And then if I want to create a, you know, store another 12 bytes, well, I can, you know, walk this list and find, oh, I, you know, I've got a, 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 a gap here. I'll write out a 12 byte record and, and store the fact that I have an, a 10 byte gap here now. So you, you can handle all this yourself. You're, you're basically implementing uh, a database and that's what I did. So like I said, it uses byte buffer or map byte buffer depending upon how you create it. Um, and it could be in memory or in memory with persistence. Uh, it creates an index file to track the record offsets within the byte buffer. And the index file is itself also a byte buffer. Uh, so it doesn't use up heap either. So you wind up with every data store you create, you have a byte buffer and, and it has an associated mapped, uh, you know, index byte buffer and that's it. So you have two Java objects on the heap and that's all. Um, and then everything else, all the data you put into it, gigabytes worth of data, if you will. Um, you, have a ter you have terabytes worth of memory, you can be terabytes worth of data. Um, get stored off the Java heap, not subject to garbage collection. Um, I made the mistake, I mentioned it before, of the, having the heap-based index and, that, and that's almost as bad as having everything on the heap. So having that byte buffer implemented in uh, to do the index uh, works out very well. And all that really meant is I had to take a hash map and implement it myself using a byte buffer, which is just an array of bytes, which was kind of fun to do. Um, you also have to manage the empty slots for compaction. I didn't do compaction, I did split objects. So what that means is, that um, you have to know where the empty slots are. So as you allocate memory in, inside your, your, your database, right, as you use parts of this byte buffer, and then you delete objects, delete records within it that leaves holes that are available, you have to track those also. Um, so it had to do that as well. So we're diving in here, retrieving a record in this implementation. What does that mean? Well, first you start by um, getting the offset to that record where it begins within your byte buffer by using the index, providing it the key. So it's, you know, it's like a name value pair. That's really what this is. This is a no SQL name value pair database. Um, you provide it the key, it finds where, where, where it exists, you know, its byte offset starts, provides you that back. You go to your byte buffer, position to it, and you start reading your data. The first thing you start reading is whether this is an active record or not. So somebody provides you a key to an object that you, or you know, a record that you deleted, you'll get back a null. If it comes back that this is yes, this is an active record in this location, then you'll actually start reading that data. You get the type, it stores the type of data that, it's, that was in that record, the length of it. And then based upon the type, 
we'll call the, the, the correct byte buffer method. If it was a long value, an integer value, double float, if it's a byte array, um, if it's a string like text there, it'll read it accordingly. Um, pretty straightforward. Writing a record is just the opposite for the most part. Um, you find a free location, the next free location that's large enough for your record. Um, and you write the, write the uh, you, you mark the first byte as being an active record now, uh, because prior to this, it was inactive because it was an empty location. You store the type, which is just a byte. You store the length, which is four bytes to store, you know, how many, the, an integer, basically a long integer there. Um, and then depending upon what's being written there, it calls byte, you know, buffer dot put long, put int. You can store the characters, you can store, uh, you know, for the string, store the bytes for the object and so forth. And then it takes the key and, and uh, gets an offset within the index, right? So uh, it, it, it has to do, to do the hash map, it ha has to do the, uh, um, you know, hash the key, um, positions within the index buffer and writes the, the, uh, the offset to the record within the, that index in, in the hash map itself. Uh, so it's, it's the implementation of a hash map within this. Um, uh, not to get in too much into the weeds here, but I found it was faster to use the key that was provided, which is a string in most cases, can be any, any object, ask Java to hash that, uh, give me a unique hash code from that, and use that as the key as opposed to storing the, storing the bytes themselves. It was actually much faster. Um, iteration is also supported. So, you know, you can store objects by key and then look them up by key later on. And uh, in my case of this messaging system, it was message IDs. Um, it could be anything, right? Um, but you may sometimes say, well, I stored a bunch of data and I just want to read through the active records and just dump them out and or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, this may be their open orders and you just want to get all the open orders and put them in a, you know, a certain order, a certain ordering and just want to read them out in that ordering. The each data item is stored with an active um, record, active byte in the beginning. So the very first byte of the byte buffer is the very first record that's within the byte buffer, and the very first byte represents whether that record is active or not. And, it, and the next one tells you the type and then the length. So you always know how many bytes to skip over to get to the next record and so forth. And you can find, okay, is this an active record? Yes, it is. And then when, where does the next record start? Well, that starts two bytes from here. And then you continue down this way. And this is an inactive record, but I still know how large this inactive record size is. So I can skip to the next record. And you can create a collection of just active records as you iterate through this byte buffer. Um, how do you use this off heap database? That's what this code is supposed to show you. And I apologize if it's too small for everybody, but uh, I'll walk through it. You know, no heap DB is the, is the main class. Within it, you can create a store, a data store, I call them. Um, and each data store can be two gigabytes of size because of that byte buffer limitation I mentioned earlier of being a signed integer max value. Um, you give it a name. And uh, you tell it whether it's in memory and so forth and what its starting size is. In this case, I said started at 256 megabytes. It will expand as you need and will actually contract as well. Uh, I think there's an option to overwrite the contraction. Um, if you want it to be stored to disk also, meaning it'll use a map byte buffer internally uh, and, a, and it'll map it to a file, uh, you use persisted as opposed to in memory. It's that simple. Writing to it, you have a couple different options. I like to keep things flexible. You know, when you create, when you call create store here, what gets returned to you is an instance of the data store class. Um, you can use that, as I show down here, you can use that data store down here, uh, or you can just say, okay, you can always just provide the name. So you can use this no heap DB, uh, you know, envelope class, if you will, and call uh, put string provide the data store name, the key and the value. Or, you know, if you save that data store object up above, you can just always call um, put integer, and you don't have to provide the name each time. Just a shortcut, however you want to do it. If you don't want to keep track of all your data stores in a, in a list, you can just, you can reference them by name. <clears throat> uh, getting, getting, so this, this shows you how to store an integer value, right? It's just put integer, just like you would inside of a hash map, for the most part, called put. Um, and then, obviously, you do the reverse to get the value out. Um, same thing with, this is how you would iterate, called iterate start. 
um, and then you go through a loop just like you would with an iterator in any type of collection, um, or you can do, I didn't implement it, you can implement for next on that as well. Um, you can delete data stores in their entirety, and once a data store is deleted, that particular object that represented that data store, that byte buffer or map byte buffer will be garbage collected, but you know, you've, you've eliminated all the garbage collection within it, which is a, a big win. Um, conclusion, and I'm just keeping track of the time here in case there are, there are uh, questions. Um, so what this represents is a memory-based data storage uh, solution with optional persistence. Um, it provides high speed because it's still within Java. Um, it's not on the heap, so it's a little bit slower. There's a slight penalty to it, um, but there's no GC interference. Um, I'd say remember there's a GC tax and allocation. I forgot to mention this. Um, remember what I said that it, it has to, it keeps track of free free sp free record spaces within this. So let's say you, you start creating and, and deleting records a lot, you'll have you'll have empty empty spots. Um, you know, you'll have this fragmentation within, within your data store. Um, you'll sometimes have to walk a list of empty locations um, that, are, that are in, I, I store them in the order of size uh, until you find one that's large enough for the record you're trying to store. Um, that can be considered a form of garbage collection, right? You're, 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 you're iterating through uh, free locations, finding one that's large enough for your record. Um, but that's done on allocation and you can control that. So again, about the predictability with a real-time application, you need that predictability. You can, you can control this and you can handle this. Um, if you need to handle that compaction better, um, you can, one of some of the things I plan to do with this is create a, a split object implementation where we'll take objects and fit them into wherever the first areas of memory that it finds that could provide a bit of a, an overhead in terms of memory as it reconstructs objects. Um, or you can compact on allocate or compact when the threshold's reached. Again, these are the things a garbage collector does, but you can, but if I were to do this in this implementation, I would provide an interface to allow the developer to control when it's done or have it be done when there's idle time and so forth. Um, again, this is easy to use in 100% Java. This uses byte buffer and memory byte buffer, which, which has been part of Java since like what, one, two, I think. Um, and map, my, map byte buffer itself ties into the operating system's virtual memory system. So it's super fast and how it persists data. Um, let me just take a quick sip of water. And I'm gonna share this updated set of slides with Yuri, but um, these are the links here, uh, the links to the article itself. It goes into much more detail on how, how this is implemented and how it's used. And also the code, the code's available in the GitHub repository I have there. I'm extending this right now and we'll, I'm gonna go, go through a demo also. I'm extending this right now to help get beyond that two gigabyte limitation. Um, how I plan to do that um, is create a segmented memory system. So if, you, if you've ever worked with Windows 3.1 or earlier, um, you know, it only supported, I forget how large, you know, it, it, it supported, it was a 16 gigabyte, 16 bit system. So, uh, you know, 16 bits uh, addressing was all handled, but the way it got around that was it created segments of memory. Um, I can do the same thing here. I can assemble multiple uh, two gigabyte size byte buffers, um, you know, grow that and, and shrink that as you exceed past that two gigabyte threshold without ever exposing that to the, to the user of the system. I'm in the middle of implementing that right now. It's just a matter of getting free time to finish it. I think it mostly works. There are just a couple little bugs. Uh, it's just a matter of optimizing it so that it, uh, you, know, you, you don't want to, gig, you know, allocate two gigabytes at a time you want to allocate chunks at a time that are reasonable, um, and and but don't wind up creating too many byte buffers and so forth. So it's always a balance there. Nothing's ever as easy as it seems. Um, and here, are just a couple more links here. I've been writing uh, articles recently on, on my own medium.com uh, blogging account. So I'm going to do a quick demo. Um, it's nothing fancy. Uh, Hopefully you can all see this well. What I've done is I've run top and it's updating every second and I've run it to sort the processes by reserved memory, which means that, you know, here, this top one here, you can see it's Java and it's really Java because it's running, running NetBeans. And even though it's, uh, it's got a 17 gigabyte or 18 gigabytes, uh, you know, 
virtual memory, only 4.9 gigabytes is reserved. That's what's committed. That's what's actually, that's the actual memory usage in the system. And if you look at that column, this column should be sorted in that reserved order. And over here, I'm gonna run an application uh, and I have a script called run that's going to execute a jar file. And I set my min and max heap size to eight megabytes but I'm telling the VM that I'm going to use more native memory actually. And you have to, you have to set this uh, if it's going to be larger than I forget what the default size is. Uh, otherwise byte buffer will, will not allow you to allocate more than what you have here. I, I said, okay, I'm gonna use up to 16 gigabytes of native memory to back that byte buffer allocation with, um, which means that you know I can never store that on the heap. So that's my way of proving to you that this is working, right? Because I only have an eight meg megabyte heap I'm setting a 16 gigabyte limit on the amount of data. I have an application here that's going to use this implementation, this database, that's going to get close to reserving all 16 gigabytes. And we're gonna see that in, when I, when I uh, show you the top here. Um, real quick, because I know that uh, I'm watching the time, uh, I'll show you the code itself. Um, this is the application that uses, uses the NoHeap DV. And just like I showed you in that example, it calls, uh, you know, it just creates a new instance, a new instance here. It actually creates 50, um, two gigabyte uh, up to, you know, 50 store data stores, uh, and just pounds it with with lots of uh, lots of data, saving lots of silly data. Really, this doesn't matter. And then it outputs the statistics about how much memory was used and the uh, collisions and, and everything. And then we're going to go to top and see the overall application uh, memory usage, even though it's it's still to the OS, it's still memory being used to show you that it's about 16 gigabytes of data that it created. So I come over here, I'll run it. It's gonna start creating all 50 data stores. And you can see that it's, uh, you know, it also outputs statistics on how fast it, it was to write the data. I think for 1.5 million objects, it's it's taking, it takes like less than 300 milliseconds on this uh, core i7 to read them, it's about you know, in the, you know, far less than that, 20 milliseconds to read through all those, looking back up on the database. Um, and now, now that it's done with that, you can see that I have a total eight eight megabyte heap, only five megabytes is that, if that's even used. I don't even know why. Uh, I guess because because the VM's just using some of it. But if you look here, I have another Java process that's running. And it has almost 16 gigabytes of data reserved. So it, it created, you could have read it from a file, you could have generated the data, got it from the network, whatever. I just generated the data while it ran there. That's what it was doing, just generating fake data um, and storing it. And there it is, 16 gigabytes of, of data. And that, that was pretty quick, right? It, 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 I allocated all this data and wrote it out to this byte buffer. Um, it's all in memory now, and that will happen pretty quickly, and, and, the, and the lookups are even faster. So um, even though I said it's a little, you have a bit of a penalty compared to using the Java heap, it's negligible. So I will stop sharing. I went through a lot there pretty quickly, and uh, I think I did pretty good on time. Do we have any questions? Was anything confusing? Did I say anything controversial or upset anybody <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks it was uh, awesome very very interesting uh i will start with uh, you know breaking the ice about the question uh let's assume that uh i want regarding the limitation of the uh, two gigabyte let's assume that i want uh, some some bigger like, like a 20 or something like that do i need this is my responsibility to do some bucket some hash on the store because I, I'm going to create 10 data stores, different 10 data stores each two gigabyte. And then I need some lookup table to do where I'm looking for what. Yeah, so I need some, this is, this is my responsibility to do. That's your responsibility to do. And I've, I've already started that implementation. Um, and the way I do it is um, when, you, when you index, when you, create, when you create the index for the record, it stores two things as the index the a byte offset, which it does now, and a segment number. And that segment number is the byte buffer itself, with, which I store within an array of byte buffers. Um, and that itself is also going to be stored on in a byte buffer. <laughs> so you can have all that off the heap. And so that when you say, okay, this object, uh, this record based upon the key is in byte buffer two, 
and its offset is with is you know this within byte buffer two or you know whatever byte buffer it is and so forth. And the thing is, you got to be smart about it. I don't want to create a byte buffer two if byte buffer one's not full. So you have to be able to span this, and then you have to be able to span. Well, what if I can I can write a one hundred? Let's say it's a it's a two k record I'm storing. And the first K can get stored in the end of byte buffer one, and the next can be stored in byte buffer two. Do you want to handle that? Are you, are you going to span the two stores? And these are the types of questions you have to answer. But yes, you have to handle that yourself. Or you just create multiples of them, and you break up your data across them, and you handle that yourself. I'm trying to make this more general purpose, so I'm taking the challenge. It's just fun to, to implement this myself. I see. OK, great. Thank you. Now, there's a question there. Um, can I read it? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, Off-heat off maps is basically trading off less GC overhead. Yep, that the smaller managed heat for a higher CPU. Yeah, or performance performance hit. Um, you don't have to serialize the objects if you don't want to. In this, if it's just data, if it's just like floating point data that you're using in, in calculations and so forth, it's a lot faster. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Um, you straight off makes sense is true big map not a lot of reads it, it, it's a trade-off right again if you if your application requires real-time behavior some predictability you want to store a lot of data that you want to make sure is not going to be susceptible to GC interference then you could do something like this and then it may be worth it for you but it has to be worth it for you you don't don't, don't want to use this if you don't need it if you want a good in, in memory database this probably provides you with that. Um, if you want to use a NoSQL database and you don't care that it's not in memory, that it's maybe running on a different machine or on the same machine in a different process, you'll be crossing process boundaries. And that if you don't care about that, that's fine. If you want it within your process, so you don't cross process boundaries, which is yet even a bigger performance hit, um, this provides you that capability. You don't have to store it. If you want to be able to simply flip a switch and have all that data get written out to disk, um, the difference between the in-memory and the persisted performance, not something I did. It's built into the JVM. It's very small. It's awesome. The JVM guys did a good job. Yeah, Great. so you can do strings and you because you can very simply, uh, the question is, what if this works for simple primitives? What if data is complex objects? Still makes sense. You can still do it because it allows you to write byte arrays, um, byte buffer, supports writing byte arrays. And all we're talking about here is a big array of bytes anyway. Um, so you write your strings out that way. You can very easily convert a string to a byte array. And you can serialize your objects to byte arrays also. Um, again, like Rami mentioned, a little bit of a performance hit you take on serialization. So if you can avoid that, do so. So the way I avoid it is I take my objects and I just write out uh, their member variables. If they are not themselves objects, then you know they, you have to make sure of that. But uh, that was the idea. With um, you know, I had that person object. There was an age that was implemented as an integer, and the salary, which was a double. And you could very easily write out those those things. What about concurrent access to the DB? Um, yeah. So byte buffer, map byte buffer support built-in concurrent access. Um, it's and I and I actually in the article. I, cr I think the article includes a sample code, uh, some sample code in the article itself and with the article download of uh, creates lots of threads that write lots of data all at the same time and read it all and, and reads and writes all at the same time. And, and it does a fantastic job. Again, not something I did. The JVM folks did a wonderful job there. I have one more question regarding the persistent. Uh, as far as I, uh, I know the operating system is a memory file. There is a, some uh, page cache. So uh, you are working with the page cache. You are not directly right to the disk. And then once you are using the persistent, it means that it lazy, going to be lazy write, you know, the, the data. So how do I use, so let's assume that I need to be a critical, a mission critical system mm. to make sure to get an ACK about the right is succeed and not lazy. So we want to do some flash or some, you know, some, some, something that maybe will require more latency, but will, will prove me that it's, it's written. So. Yeah, it's been, I have a habit of always forgetting how I did things, but I think if we look in here, it does call flush. Um, 
So yeah, but flash is a, but flash is a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a less performant action. Yeah. Because, you know, because you are doing flash, you are going to the operating system and tell him right now. And, and uh, in most of the cases, it's not, maybe not the case that they want, but for some times or for some use cases, I do want to control the flash itself. Yeah. In this case, in this implementation, I took the approach that it, if you're, if you're using a map byte buffer and you, you said, if you said persist, you want it persisted for every record written, it did a flush at the end. I, I see. I see. You okay. can, I mean, it could be extended. You can add an option to say la lazy writing's fine, or you can say critical, you know, I can make, you can, I can add that option. And in that case, it does the flush. Um, you can, again, you got all the code. You can, you can, you can control this. Great. Yeah. Good questions. Hey, Eric, uh, sorry for not turning on the video. It's a bit dark here. Uh, I have a um, I have a question. So we we previously had a lecture from a, a researcher in Yahoo Research Labs that released an open source called Oak. Um, it was I think they used it because they had a problem with their age based deployments and they again, using a lot of GC and they wrote a, a concurrent off heap key value map, I think. Not the database per se, but uh, wonder, wondering if you had a chance uh, to look at it. You know, I have a link here to an article to an article someone wrote on a system very similar to mine. And I wonder if it was for Oak. Um, let me see. The person's name is uh, KD Gregory. I wonder if this is the person who developed Oak. I think I've seen it, um, but I didn't look at it specifically because I had started implementing mine already. Uh, and I wanted to do mine without being uh, tainted by how Oak yeah. is. Um, just and for no other, I don't plan to sell this, but for no other reason than I wanted to do this myself as an exercise. Um, but it does, sound, it does sound like it's very similar. I'll take a look at that. Um, but uh, you know, I use this as an opportunity to, um, I don't know, is Oak open source? Uh, yeah, they decided to open source it. Okay. I good. think I'll, I'll put the link in the chat right now. I, I think I saw overall uh, when I when I also when um, I did a due diligence with uh, with uh, that person, uh, we also found another one. It's called the MapDB. I think it operates uh, less efficient, but the, the same. Um, the same uh, principle of trying to use uh, off heap. Uh, I'll put it in the chat if it's interesting yeah, to mean, anyone it's, else. It's reasonable to, 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 to understand that I'm not the first one to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, I think it's a, it's, it, you can learn uh, from every project just a little bit more. That's right. And it's always fun to do things yourselves. And I, and I, and I took it as an opportunity for myself to learn and also to share through the article on Java Magazine. So that's why I continued it. And also, I have some plans for it uh, to extend it in certain ways. Um, some of the things I plan to do that maybe these others don't do is uh, using a disaggregated approach. Let's say you have and this. This ties into some of my work I'm doing um, in my day job. Let's say you have multiple computers um, and they're all small, smaller capacity, but you put them together, you have a lot of capacity, you have a lot of storage capacity. Can you hide the fact that you have all this disaggregated storage from the programmer and write this data out to multiple nodes? under the covers and then, you know, know where to get the data to reassemble it later and so forth. Um, that, could, that could be an interesting use case for people that need to store large amounts of data that are too large for a single node, but they, have, they, can, they can spread it out across multiple nodes or multiple disks and so forth. So that's one of the things I'd like to do here also. I have lots of plans for things like that. By doing this myself, it gives me the ability to, to explore. Thanks. So thanks for pointing those two out. And uh, I, I think, I, like I said, I think I've looked at, at them to a certain degree. OK, great. So uh, someone else about questions? And if we don't have a question now uh, or we have to go, um, you have my email address. You can always uh, reach out later. We can, if anyone has any uh, fantastic ideas and where to take this, share them and, or, or go ahead and, and look at the code and see what we can do. Great. Uh, we will put the links inside the comments of the event itself. Uh, soon we will send uh, regarding the recording. 
we will put it uh, as well in the in our YouTube channel, and uh, you will share with us. Uh, uh, you already shared with me a presentation, so I can put it some uh, somewhere online, so uh, folks here can uh, just grab it and uh, use it. I'll send you the updated slides. I think I've added quite a few. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, I great, took, great. Took the yeah. opportunity to fill it out a little more, and I hope that you know, with everything that we did in the beginning, the real time stuff that at least there was some new information in there. People learned something and then they found it interesting to dive into how, we, how it all came together at the end with that, that off heap DB. So I hope everyone liked it. Thank you. Cool. It was a very great uh, session. Thank you very much for all the folks here uh, to join us. And uh, again, uh, stay tuned. Yeah, let's all stay in touch. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good day. Thank right, you. Bye-bye. Good night.